Coming up on Two and a Half Geeks, we're going to be talking about SSDs, EEE pads, and even 3D monitors, and more. The bar has been set wicked fast. It rocked in the benchmarks. We're going to up the ante uh, a little bit. Processing power. Maybe. I kind of understand this. Oh, hello. Welcome back to Two oh. and a Half Geeks. I'm Aya Zaktar, alongside Dave Altavilla and Marco Cipetta. So you've made it past the tease and the intro credits. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> How are you guys doing? <laughs> doing all Pretty right. Pretty good. How are you? I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. Uh, uh, let, let's talk a little bit about some uh, serious news that happened this week. Uh, Co-founder of Apple Computers, uh, Steve Jobs, passed away this week. Uh, do you guys have any th any thoughts about Mr. Jobs? Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, <laughs> it's, it's, what do you say about a guy who was um, larger than life, you know? I mean, uh, the, you know, the passing of Steve Jobs is a, a, a mark in history that uh, we will all remember. Where were you? when he uh, left this earth and uh, he did some pretty amazing life-changing things in his lifetime and uh, some pretty amazing uh, life-changing uh, creations and uh, you know uh, uh, really a, a, a man amongst men you know just just a, an impressive individual to um, you know have in our lifetime um, and uh, the world is certainly um, left with uh, a big hole without Steve around. Uh, he will be missed, guaranteed, by geeks and and mainstream folk alike. How about you, Marco? Any any, any thoughts? Yeah, I actually had a really weird reaction. You know, I've I've been into computers since I don't know the third grade when I got my first Commodore, and you know, I've basically rode the wave through the Amiga, the uh, Apple II, Apple II GS, Atari ST, I've kind of had everything. And and I've always been sort of the, uh, you know, the PC guy, the tinkerer. I wasn't always into the Apple stuff. But I, I obviously, I, I recognize the greatness in that man. He, he's obviously a genius. Uh, no one better at, at selling a product and creating products that people like. And when I heard the news, I, I actually genuinely had a, felt a sense of loss. It was it was kind of strange. I, I didn't, you know, obviously we all kind of thought this was coming, knowing how sick he was and that he stepped down. But I was kind of surprised at my reaction. It was it was it was kind of strange. I, I genuinely, maybe because I'm so entrenched in tech, I genuinely feel a sense of loss uh, now that he's died. It's I don't know, know how to explain it any better than that. Yeah, I was trying to make sense of it myself. Like, why did I feel a sense a sense of personal loss? I didn't know the man. I didn't I didn't get to meet him or yeah. have a conversation with him. And I think uh, a lot of that had to do just by watching the presentations, the vibrancy, the amount of energy he had in his conversations, the passion he had for his job, uh, that kind of stuff it just makes you think, okay, this guy can't ever go away. And uh, that is why I think we uh, most of the tech field was hit pretty hard. But right now, yeah. we're going to move to a much lighter topic, uh, the stuff that we, we do enjoy a lot. We love hardware. We love tech. We're going to be talking about Samsung SSDs. I know it's not as serious, so let, let, let's uh, go back to the silliness, the silliness so that is the world of technology. Marco, you get to test out the Samsung SSD 830. Easy for me to read because uh, I'm all <laughs> goofy. Oh, you had a preview anyway. Uh, what can you tell us about this right. SSD? So it was actually a pretty pretty exciting drive to test out. You know, I think there's something like I don't know, 36 or 38 manufacturers selling Sandforce-based drives, and they all sort of perform similar similarly, slightly different firmwares here and there. So they're not all the same. So it was actually really interesting to test something totally different. Uh, the Samsung 830 series SSD is a 100% Samsung drive, Samsung controller, Samsung firmware. Samsung DRAM cache and Samsung NAND all crammed into this uh, SATA 3 drive. And throughout testing, it, it put up some, some pretty impressive numbers. As the workloads kind of got heavier when the Q depths went up, something like in Crystal, Di Crystal Disk Mark or Iometer, it was actually one of the fastest performing drives we've tested. Uh, the same in some of the, the standard read benchmarks. It put up some of the best scores. Drives rated for something like 520 megasecond reads. Um, in writes is the only area where it, it sort of trailed um, the Sandforce drives that are out there. But performance was still strong. It, it was a really nice drive to test out. Do you think the fact that it's Samsung through and through actually made a difference in this kind of thing? Or did you see 
other drives out there that have had uh, varying components that did as well? Well, there's other drives that perform as well. Um, the, the main difference, let's say, with this drive and the Sandforce uh, 2200 series drives uh, are that the performance of this thing kind of stays flat no matter what kind of data you throw at it. Whereas the Sandforce drives, just the way they work, they perform differently with uh, compressible or, or incompressible data. So it was, it was interesting to see a drive with a completely different performance profile uh, than the more common Sandforce drives. And it, even though it was different, it was actually very good. It was a better performer with incompressible data, um, although in writes, maybe not quite as good, but still very good. Uh, I think the, the fact that Samsung can control every component um, in the device is going to be interesting once it hits the market because they can basically set the pricing where they want, you know, as long as it's profitable. So the drives are going to ship in a few weeks. They should be available mid-October. They should be priced around the same price as the current uh, 470 series drives, which means they're going to be kind of uh, in the upper mid-range. Um, but I don't know. It's going to be uh, interesting to see what the street prices are and if performance gets better with new firmwares. I think it's a strong product. You know what's also interesting to see is the e-pad slider. You know, I've, I've seen a couple pictures of this thing, and it kind of reminds me of a smartphone and its display. Now. Uh, I think, Dave, you might actually have one around, possibly. It's a, it's a, it's a tablet that seems to be not quite a laptop, uh, not uh, quite a tablet, some kind of hybrid thing. So tell us about this thing. This is the EPAT slider, obviously. Yes, there it is right there. And um, as you can see, the, the hinge mechanism, and then it just slides right down nice and neat into a standard tablet form factor. Um, I really like this device, and I'll tell you why. Um, the first thing that isn't obvious, uh, you know, obviously there's there's a keyboard here, and 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 that's clearly the the, the slider's big hook, um, is that you have access to this nice chiclet style keyboard. It's it's netbook sized, I would say, uh, in spacing in terms of the size of the keycaps. But but if you look right here, the tablet itself is propped up at a 45 degree angle, thereabouts. So what does that do for you? Obviously, when, when Apple came out with the iPad and the iPad 2, they had this case that they designed that you could prop up your tablet and set it up on the table. Um, you know, it would protect the front of the, of the tablet, but when you popped it open and folded it back, it, it tipped the tablet up, and you could now access the screen a lot better. That's, a, that's an, an obvious design um, feature that um, doesn't quite jump out at you run, right away. Uh, in addition to to the keyboard, now the tablet's set up 45 degree angle when you have it on a tabletop, coffee table, wherever you're at, and it's accessible. It's accessible from a keyboard standpoint, you know, with 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 that keyboard uh, stretched out, and now you can type into the URL bar. But it's also accessible from a touch standpoint. It's not laying flat on the horizontal. You have the best viewing angle. You don't have to hold it in your hand. It's propped up for you. And so I really like it just for that very simple mechanical design feature that, um, you know, Asus thought out of the box to, uh, to, to put into their new tablet. Now, I like the fact that they actually, they, the design is not going to be confused with a lot of other tablets out there. So it has an interesting slider mechanism. But at what point are you just replicating a laptop? What is the advantage of having a tablet that also has a keyboard as opposed to just having a full-fledged laptop that has a traditional hinge? I mean, does the, I mean, is it the operating system? Is it the hinge? Is the hinge such a, such a huge draw that this is why you would pick this e-pad over a, a laptop? What do you think? Well, for one thing, you know, make no mistake, it's thinner than the average netbook by a fair amount. I mean, uh, I, I want to say it's, you know, when it's in this closed position, it's something like 0.6 inches thick. It's a little over half inch thick. Um, so it's very thin. It's thinner than than any, you know, netbook. Maybe some of these new small ultrabooks that are out right now uh, could compete in the, the thinness and, and the, the weight of it. Um, it's, it's about two pounds. Um, so it's also very light. Um, it, it gives you uh, the other thing that's that's better about it than a, than a standard you know netbook or notebook is that you have the touch interface and you have the Android experience touch interface. You know if you had a even if you had a notebook with you know uh, Windows Seven on it, you know for example, you, 
you're going to get the Windows 7 Touch Pack, and let's face it, that, that leaves a lot to be desired in terms of touch interface. So this is, you know, dual core, Tegra 2, a 1 gigahertz processor under the hood, a gig of RAM, 16 or 32 gig storage onboard uh, storage uh, configurations available with a slide out keyboard with all that touch that uh, touch interface goodness that we've be, you know become to uh, n know and love with Android that's now much begin begun to mature and compete at least um, you know a little bit more handily with with uh, Apple's iOS all rolled up into one for really what is a, a standard tablet price 479 for the 16 gig variant you can you can get this this tablet for you know, about the price of, of any Android tablet on the market. So really some additional features. You also get a, a, a USB 2.0 port, USB 2 port, excuse me, um, on the, the keyboard itself and HDMI. So some, some nice additional features and, and functionality for, for no extra upside cost, really. And Marco, I'm kind of curious what you think about all the unusual form factors that are coming out there. I mean... The, there's a there's Sony's uh, I guess it's the tablet P the one that actually folds it's got two screens there's uh, there's mm -hmm. this this slider uh, EPC there's I mean EPad there, and there's there's all kinds of things transformers and all these re dis designs that mm -hmm. really seem to be generated from smartphones or tablet hybrids and laptops what what do you think about the design aspects do you think this is a trend do you think there's going to be a winner or is this just throwing spaghetti at a wall. I think the slider is going to be a winner. As far as all the different form factors that are coming, I, I think it's just a byproduct of the relative immaturity of the market. You know, as, as the tablets get more powerful, they're kind of morphing to become more notebook-like. And in the notebook space, you know, the big trend or the big push that Intel is, is set forth with is uh, the Ultrabooks, which are going to shrink them down and try to get them more tablet-like. It, they'll they're they're going to converge at some point. You know, prices are too close. I, I don't know. I, all I can say right now is, being a, a PC geek, I have a tablet in, in the house next to me. Um, I'm not going to name which one since it doesn't matter which one it is. But I, I got this tablet for an event. I updated the software. Uh, I'm used it for that day, and I've never turned it on since. So all right, well, I, I don't know. Let me ask you a <laughs> quick quick question on that, Marco. So. So yep. when you're when you're typing on that tablet, and, and this is what I like about the slider, when you're typing on the tablet, um, and you have the the you know touch interface keyboard up, it doesn't feel comfortable, right? It's it's not it's not absolutely not not for me, not not with these bear claws, no. Right. So so now you have a tablet that's almost as thin, obviously not quite as thin as a as a straight up tablet, a slate. But it will slide out that keyboard when you want to get at it, bang in a URL or bang out a quick email, and then slide in out of the way and compact uh, and give you that tablet, you know, traditional tablet interface and feel after you're done banging on the keyboard for just that short right. burst that you need to bang out. Pretty good, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, think that's so, what I like. My, my, issue, my issue here isn't necessarily the keyboard. I find, and my, my wife is the same way, we had this conversation because I've been trying to find a reason to buy a tablet. Um, we're, we both grab our phones when we, you know, our, our Android phones when we want to just check something quick on the web. And if we want to do something a little, you know, a little more uh, taxing, we jump on a PC because it's right in the other room. So I, I think I haven't found a tablet that strikes that perfect balance where I would just leave it in the living room and grab it when I need it. I, I, I you know really what? don't know. I, I don't know how to explain it better than that. It's uh, Between my phone and my PC, I personally am struggling finding a reason to have a slate around. I'll, I'll give you one, and it's my guilty pleasure. I tablet in bed. <laughs> That's what my Kindle's for. I read and I use my Kindle and I read well, in bed. Well, this is well, going down a rabbit hole. Exactly, let, exactly what I do. Let's yeah. go somewhere else. Let's go to the desktop where you probably <laughs> you might have a 3D monitor out there because I know, Marco, you guys did a 3D monitor shootout with an Acer yeah. and a ViewSonic. So I'm assuming that you aren't you weren't uh, testing this in bed. Uh, I, I I don't know why would I even assume that. Let's actually talk about. <laughs> How these things performed, and what are the actual model numbers? Is the Acer? He needs 3D in bed. H yeah. <laughs> Marco, take it away, please. Please bring back hey, sanity. Yeah. So it, it it was actually um, our girl JJ Kid Dynamite Jennifer Johnson did this article. Yeah, but um, we had uh, our, our very own JJ. She had the the Acer HN 274H and the ViewSonic V3D 245. 
the the Acer monitor is a nice big 27 uh, 27 inch screen. The ViewSonic is a 24 inch uh, 24 inch screen. Well, 23.6, but basically 24. And yeah, so what's interesting about these screens is the the built in 3D. They feature Nvidia's 3D vision technology integrated into the bezels, so you don't have the separate emitter that's necessary to sync up with the wireless glasses. Um, and through testing, she liked both screens. Uh, it's kind of tough to to show off the 3D, you know, in a, in a in an article because there's no way to show it off if somebody doesn't have the glasses and a 3D screen. But what's interesting with these guys, other than the 3D, is that to achieve that, they're 120 hertz panels, so they're refreshing twice as fast as a typical LCD. So they have other benefits besides just 3D. So you could watch, let's say you can probably do a lot better gaming if you wanted to do to-do gaming, this kind of refresh thing. I mean, what else could you use 120 hertz for? I mean, I assume that you don't have a lot of blur going on with that kind of refresh rate. I mean, it, uh, the other thing is, uh, what could you use it for in 2D? And how, this, for 3D, is there enough content, enough gaming, enough out there that it's worthwhile? Absolutely, especially with NVIDIA's 3D Vision. NVIDIA natively supports and has tested 525 uh, gaming titles, you know, including titles that haven't come out yet. I I've seen stuff um, that's coming out in a few weeks in 3D that is awesome. I can't say anything else other than that, but it's just so good. It's, you know, it changes the game when you play in 3D for the better. But as far as the 120 hertz advantages on the desktop, just having the faster uh, screen redraws when you're you know, moving windows or a, a Windows animation is happening. They look good on 60 hertz screens, but when you see it side by side with 120 hertz, it just looks more fluid. Redraws are faster. Content in the window kind of stays there. And when you're gaming, you could set VSync to on and still, if you have a graphics card fast enough, achieve 120 frames per second. So you get more fluid gaming in 2D as well. There, there's just really no disadvantage to the 120 hertz panel other than that most of them are, are TN panels and aren't quite as high end as a, you know, a better quality IPS panel. I don't know, having a monitor, a second monitor. What, what if you wanted an all-in-one PC? Maybe, maybe Hot Hardware had some kind of uh, a look perhaps at an um, Asus uh, ETOP, I believe it's the AIO. Uh, Dave, do you know anything about what I'm talking about? Am I making up things? Because I might be making up things. <laughs> Well, AIO stands for all-in-one, and uh, it's actually the ETOP uh, ET2011 oh. that we looked at. Um, and, uh, yeah, actually, it's, uh, it's our week for Asus, evidently. We, we, we took a, a look at another Asus thing from the slider to something significantly larger. This is a 20-inch all-in-one PC. It's based on AMD's new 1.6 gigahertz uh, Fusion E350 processor, uh, dual-core. And uh, has four gig of uh, DDR3 system memory, uh, integrated AMD uh, HD uh, Radeon HD 6310 graphics, and a one terabyte 7200 RPM hard drive. Uh, 20 inch LCD, uh, 16 by 9 or 1600 by 900 um, native resolution, all for 500 bucks, and that includes an optical drive too, and integrated Wi-Fi and the whole shoot and match. But 500 bucks, you can just get yourself like a little tiny laptop or even a little, I don't know, HTPC. Uh, where, where do you see a 20-inch all-in-one PC going anyway? Do you see it in a dorm room? Do you see it in your garage, a basement? I mean, at this point, isn't 20 inches a little small, actually, for, for an all-in-one? Uh, well, yeah, yeah, certainly there's some all-in-ones that, you know, HP's TouchSmart and even certainly Asus has uh, 24 and 27-inch. Uh, machines. Uh, this is a. Uh, you really need to look at this competitive to solutions like you know the IMAX out there. I mean, obviously there is a market space in general, a niche for the all-in-one PC. This is a smaller uh, version of that. Uh, if you think about you know what's under the hood of this machine, you know from a, a one terabyte hard drive to integrated super, uh, you know multi DVD burner. 4 gig of RAM, a dual core, you know, AMD Fusion processor, um, you know, solid performance. This has a, a sort of a combination of notebook and desktop components that add up to, you know, performance that's very competitive with a mainstream notebook from a general performance standpoint, but 
capacity and usage model, that one terabyte hard drive, for example, the, the, the DVD-ROM burner and all that good stuff built in in a 20-inch panel, all for 500 bucks. So you're getting a much larger screen. Obviously, you know, 17-inch notebooks, you know, with, with these, this kind of configuration, you're not going to find for, for that price range. Much larger screen. It's not touch-enabled. Um, so a lot of features. It's it's not a huge screen, but 20 inches isn't you know exactly small either. It's it's a good sort of mainstream PC size screen. You're not going to game heavy duty on it. But where I see this fitting would be uh, perhaps in the kitchen for some folks on the on the countertop, family PC. You want to look up a recipe. You want to surf the web, check the weather, check an email real quick while you're cooking up dinner. That works well. Um, the other obvious you mentioned uh, in the dorm room, certainly tight spaces where you need, you know, a PC functionality and access uh, with not a lot of uh, room uh, to spare and or you want it to look good. I mean, this is a, a sleek sort of thin, very thin, actually, uh, form factor, uh, ergo, you know, nice ergonomic uh, sleek designs, you know, black and glossy looks real sharp. And so uh, puts the PC experience in, in places that might not fit or you know need to look a little bit nicer aesthetically rather than just plunking a box down in a monitor you know somebody out there is going to have a pretty awesome computer experience a pc experience because i i, I think you guys are going to announce who <laughs> won the labor day gaming system giveaway we already did oh you did marco yes can you tell the audience <laughs> well that guy already knows but the people who are watching might not have noticed who right. won the contest so our forum member, who goes by the handle RR Play, um, his real name is Peter. Um, this guy absolutely deserved to win. He was all over the site. He was sharing our stuff all over Facebook. And when we announced him as the winner, he was super excited, genuinely, genuinely super happy. I love when we have winners that are truly appreciative and not just people that are you know, around the site hoping to win, uh, maybe tossed a thing up on eBay. This guy is so excited. I'm so excited that he won. Um, I'm going to be building the machine hopefully in the next few days. I'm just waiting for the, uh, the case to come in. Um, this was, there was kind of a twist on this contest. He got to pick the color. We had three different colors. So that stuff is on the way. And Peter, as soon as I have it, I'm going to shoot some video of uh, myself building it. And we are going to get it off to you. So I think it was what? What red, color did he pick? Yeah, red, white, or black. What did he pick? He picked, oh, he, he picked black. He wanted black. He picked black. Ah. Didn't go with the uh, super hot red. Surprise. I like yeah, the white. I tried, to, I tried to talk him into the white, but uh, he wanted the black. Well, I mean, to each their own, and uh, he gets to have it because Mark is going to build it right for you. That's that's great. You guys want to drop any hints? Because I know you guys are always working on giving away stuff. Any, any more contests coming up uh, you want to just kind of yes. say? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so there, there, there will always be another contest on the horizon. We have not nailed down all the details for the next one, um, but you will be one of the first to know, Iaz, because we typically announce through the podcast. I will know. Yeah. I'm never eligible, though. That's the problem anyway. So enjoy your, your <laughs> stuff, guys. That, that's our, our play. Congratulations. That's cool. Very cool. And around, you know what? You can find out uh, details about this. Maybe you're not watching the podcast. You're like you're just hanging around the internet. You're like, I want to go check out hotharbor.com because that's where all the, the information is about the stories we talked about and eventual contest details and mm -hmm. all kinds of stuff like that. But again, if you want to go around the web and you go, I really want to try a different piece of the internet, you can and still get hot hardware content. Dig.com slash hot hardware, twitter.com slash hot hardware, facebook.com slash hot hardware. And don't forget, youtube.com slash hot hardware vids. Woo, that's a lot of them. Is there any more of them? No, no, you got it. Just, just the classic venues. The classics around well, the web. And then there, there's always, there's always uh, starwars.com slash hoth ardware. That's, that's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> go, now, that now a bunch of people are going to check that out. Uh, when you see that it's uh, not related at all, if that does exist, um, let us know. You can, uh, you can always. 403 Forbidden. That, that's a secret site. <laughs> anyway, thanks for stopping by this episode of Two and a Half Geeks. <laughs>